welcome to this latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary, and all of us at FPRI thank you for joining us live on Zoom and recorded on the FPRI YouTube page. March 2023 marks the 20th anniversary of Operation Iraqi Freedom, which toppled the government of Saddam Hussein, a war of choice whose authors promised would solve the problems of the Middle East in the aftermath of 9-11, the invasion of Iraq instead opened an era of new and bitter conflict whose consequences are still being felt from Baghdad to Baltimore to Bakhmut. The anniversary has thus unsurprisingly been the occasion for a variety of works considering the origins, course, and consequences of this destructive war. For all the efforts to analyze, understand, and critique U.S. policy leading up to the war, however, there have been few serious efforts to understand Iraqi policy between Operation Desert Storm in 1991 and the overthrow of Saddam in 2003. The notable exception here is Dr. Sam Helfont, whose deep immersion in Ba'ath Party documents has opened up new perspectives on Iraqi policy. He's already produced a brilliant book on the political religious roots of the insurgency in Iraq based on his Princeton dissertation and published in 2018 as Compulsion in Religion, Saddam Hussein, Islam, and the Roots of Insurgency in Iraq, which we discussed on Geopolitics with Granary once upon a time. His new book, Iraq Against the World, examines Iraq's international strategy from 1990 to 2003 and its impact on the post-Cold War international order. Through his creative use of Iraqi sources, Helfont shows us how Saddam and his party and his government tried to use a variety of influence operations to undermine the new world order promised by George H.W. Bush with profound implications for the world to come. As he concludes in the book, the Baathists frustrated American policies, chipped away at American alliances, and diluted American ambitions for the post-Cold War order. Baathist actions humbled proponents of a liberal international order and empowered its critics. As a result, the post-American world is less likely to emerge within and through liberal internationalist institutions and more likely to emerge in conflict with them. So what did Iraq try to do in the years between the Gulf Wars? Where did they succeed and why? How much have those Iraqi influence efforts shaped contemporary geopolitics? These questions and yours will guide us in our conversation this afternoon with Dr. Sam Helfont. Dr. Sam Helfont is an Iraqi war veteran of the United States Navy and a longtime senior fellow in FPRI's Middle East program. He is an assistant professor of strategy and policy in the Naval War Colleges program at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He holds a PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University, and we are delighted to have him with us today. Greetings to you, Sam Helfont. Thanks, Ron, and uh, thanks to FPRI for, uh, for everything it does and for hosting me today. Absolutely. So um, while I while we begin our conversation, I want to remind all our live listeners that you can use the Q&A feature to post questions that I hope to be able to, in, to involve and introduce into our conversation. But I want to start, Sam, with a, with a basic question. That is, what led you to write this book as a follow-up to your previous book? Had you, had you seen these uh, documents and they got you thinking about what you wanted to do? Or you know, what, le what led to this? Uh, yeah, so in my, my previous uh, work, I was always interested in sort of Iraqi international affairs. I'd written some articles about you know, uh, religion and foreign policy. But uh, I came across a particular organization within the party. It kept on showing up. It was called the Iraqi Bath Party outside of Iraq, something like that, right? They've changed its name several times. Um, and uh, no one that I knew, it wasn't in any of the literature, um, no one that I knew that had been an Iraq expert had, had ever said anything about this organization. Um, but there are, you know, thousands, probably tens of thousands of pages in, of their files, at least uh, in the Iraqi uh, archives, in the Bath Party's archives. Uh, and they were doing all sorts of things. They were spread out, you know, they had, it was basically an organization that had formed uh, branches of the Ba'ath Party among the, the Arab diaspora around the world. Uh, and they had sort of embedded themselves within these different kinds of groups and social uh, organizations and students and women and whatever it was. Uh, and something like, at its height, it had 69 different branches in 69 different countries uh, around the world. So it was quite extensive and they were doing a lot and they were producing a lot of reports. Um, and I was really interested to see, you know, first of all, what was this organization? Uh, what were they doing? And I quickly 
uh, came to realize that they were a sort of central pillar of Iraq's strategy uh, under Saddam Hussein, uh, and that they could be a sort of window into, um, into Iraq's broader sort of international affairs, especially since the, the records of the, the foreign ministry uh, were destroyed in 2003. So these are some of the best sort of primary source internal Iraqi uh, documents about what actually, when the rubber hit the road, what were the Iraqis doing uh, and, and how did they see the world and how did they try to um, achieve their, their goals, um, especially in the post-Cold War period? I'm I, I'm fascinated by this idea that they had 69 different uh, branches or efforts around the world. Um, did somehow, despite the fact that Iraq had perhaps ruined their relationships with some Arab states by their behavior in the first Gulf War, the the Baath, the this Baathist party overseas was still still had enough credibility, I guess, to to have contacts uh, throughout the Arab world. Well, first of all, uh, I think they probably had more, uh, mm. not as Baathist necessarily, mm. uh, but as um, a political organization that was resisting um, sort of American domin domination, the sort of overwhelming American power that was sort of sweeping across the world in the post-Cold War uh, period. In fact, in the mm. 1980s, you know, this organization had, had, had its, its beginning in 1982. Um, and it wasn't very successful in the 1980s because the narratives just didn't line up. Uh, there wasn't that much sympathy for Iraq in the Iran-Iraq war, right? right. Um, but after the Gulf War, during and after the Gulf War, uh, there is not among the diplomats and the statesmen, uh, but on what sometimes called the Arab street, mm -hmm. uh, but not just in the Arab world, you know, in the West, right? There are, um, you know, everything from right-wing isolationists to left-wing sort of peace activists, student groups, Islamists, um, pacifists, people who don't like American policies uh, toward Iraq, uh, they began working. You know, they, they were more open to working with people who shared their views, right? And these Iraqis, I should say, they didn't always tell people they were Baathists, right? They were simply Iraqis concerned about, uh, you know, the very real suffering um, that was happening in, in Iraq during the 1990s. And they found, I, I would say, more sympathetic audiences for this post the Gulf War, after the Gulf War, uh, than they did prior to it. Even if Saddam himself and, and official Iraqi diplomats uh, were unwelcome uh, mm -hmm. in, in most foreign capitals, probably actually made them more important uh, right. towards Iraqi strategies. And so that took that took a great deal of subtlety on the part of the Iraqi regime to recognize that this possibility existed. I mean, for for a regime that was very built around the personality of Saddam, for him to be willing to let's say step back enough to allow these organizations to do their work. Um, do you get a sense of how much Saddam tried to steer this organization and how much he simply uh, sort of accepted the information that it brought him? Um, no, he, he definitely was trying to steer it. And he was concerned, uh, him personally, he was concerned that it could be exploited. Uh, there was some, you know, they, they were very, they had very tight security controls on who led these organizations. So for example, you know, if you're going to be um, the head, they called it, you know, the official of an embassy, right? It was the, right. the party, it was the party official. They just called it the official of, of the embassy. Um, this person was vetted very closely by the regime, much more than say the diplomats or even the ambassador, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they often had a special place in the embassy where they could go uh, and the ambassadors talk about it. They, they weren't allowed to enter these 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 spaces where um, the Ba'ath Party was running its, uh, um, its operations. So they, they did keep uh, sort of, they tried to keep a tight political control over these organizations ideologically. Uh, on the other hand, you know, Saddam was flexible enough um, to try a, a number of things. It's a sort of trope, I think you would say, that, that Saddam or other regimes like his uh, were completely inflexible and just this kind of totalitarian top-down dictating what was happening. What you see in the records is Iraqis do say, hey, this isn't working, right? We have this, mm -hmm. this plan. It's not working. Let's try something else. Um, and the, the Ba'ath Party is doing that with its political narratives. Uh, I'll give one example in, in, in the Gulf War. Uh, sure. It wasn't necessarily from the Ba'ath Party, but it's Saddam changing and, and, and seeing, seeing the realities, the political realities, and then adjusting. So going into the Gulf War, Saddam had this idea that he should be present himself as a strong Arab leader, 
right? Mm -hmm. Don't show weakness. Uh, and if you can be a strong Arab leader standing up to these Americans, uh, that will be the way to gain support. Uh, during the Gulf War, what he finds out is, first of all, you can't stand up to the Americans. Second of all, there's actually a lot of sympathy for uh, Iraqi suffering, for Iraqi mm -hmm. weakness, right? So um, there is, for example, a, a bunker that's bombed in Baghdad, uh, and it has over 400 civilians in it. The Americans mistakenly uh, identify it as a, as a command and control facility. It's actually a civilian uh, bunker. Uh, and, you know, these civilians are, are killed, families, kids, everything. Um, and all of a sudden, these calls pour in from around the world, including American allies, saying we have to stop this war, right? Uh, the Americans don't stop the war, but they do stop from that point forward. They do stop bombing Baghdad. They, they stop these deep uh, strategic bombing campaigns. Uh, and Saddam realizes, hey, uh, there's actually a power here in weakness, not in looking strong, but in looking weak. So if you talk to journalists who were on the ground in the Gulf War, um, I mean, one of them told me before that bombing, all the regime, the regime never wanted to show you dead bodies. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to see any, any casualties. Iraq is doing fine. After that bombing, all they wanted to do was show you dead bodies, right? Because now they realized, you know, Saddam realized, hey, that's actually the way forward. So they're always adjusting like this uh, throughout. And mm -hmm. they are also, you know, they don't care about the ideology of the people that are cooperating with them. Uh, they don't tell people that they're Baathists always. And, you know, it doesn't matter, communists, hardcore nationalists, whatever you are, if you're against after the, after the war, if you're against sanctions on Iraq, if you're against the Gulf War, if you're against wars on Iraq, um, they're going to support you and they're going to they're going to take that support, even if they completely disagree with you ideologically. Uh, and so they were flexible enough to do that, too. Yeah, well, and, and that's because I'm 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 fascinated by that. Right. The, the willingness to do that. We do have, you know, I'm. I don't want to fall into the trap that too many Americans have fallen into talking about Saddam's regime, but I will say that um, as a German historian, I know of a, I know of a government that actually had a party apparatus overseas that uh, that operated parallel to the Foreign Office, um, uh, and so, but the Baathists are not they're not the Nazi Party, but that they that they have this parallel institution that looks to spread. And work the influence of the of the Iraqi state. I am curious: Did other Middle Eastern states that you are aware of have similar organizations? Well, there's Baathist organizations elsewhere, right? right? right. So uh, in, in Syria, for example, mm -hmm. they right. have a uh, uh, a Baath party, uh, which had a similar type of organization. I don't know overseas mm -hmm. um, what they had. Um, I don't know, you know, there are similar sort of, so this, the structure that they have is a sort of clandestine structure, this cell structure that actually comes out of Europe, right? It comes out mm -hmm. of Europe in the 1920s and, 19, and 1930s. And you can see it because when they're, when the Baathists are speaking to like their communist counterparts in Europe in the 1980s, uh, they're giving their sort of like party rank and it's the same, the same terms, right? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's not always clear in English and Arabic, but when they're in Arabic, they're, it's clear that they're the, they're the same. Um, other states that had the, the Muslim Brotherhood has something like this, but they weren't ever ruling in in this yeah. way. Um, another thing, though, that makes Iraq, I think, probably different than a lot of other states is Saddam himself. In mm -hmm. that, um, yes, he wears a military uniform all the time, and he's got the medals and all the all the, the pomp and circumstance that goes around with that. But he never really served in, in the military, uh, unlike most, uh, you know, dictators we can call them and, and, and the arabs were you know the assad assad the first one not, not the current one nasser um you know whoever else ruled these, Gaddafi, these states these are all yeah, military they're, guys. They're, they're mostly military officers yeah. and they they ruled through the military uh saddam was not a military officer he had tried to attend the military academy and, and, and failed uh and comes up through the party mm -hmm. um, and because he comes up to the party the party is always uh his sort of base of support at the expense often of the military and the other um at the other state institutions uh which he doesn't always trust hmm. well and and that gets uh because that's that's a fascinating question right is you when you decide you know what institutions are you going to use how are you going to to control them to make sure that they're not being turned against you, right? That that Saddam always had that concern that anybody who was too good at dealing with the public or had too many international contacts might wake up one day and decide they wanted to replace Saddam Hussein, right? And that certainly was not, uh, no, he was not in favor of that.
But in your in your book, right, you 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 attack something or you 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 cover something that I think is particularly interesting these days. That is this this idea of influence operations. Um, and you mentioned how a, a true influence operation, right? You don't really care, but you're, you're not worried about being consistent or coherent, right? You're just worried, you know, you have the, the larger goal is you want to undermine American support for further sanctions on, on Iraq. And so it doesn't matter who, but the problem with influence operations is if they're supposed to be subtle, it's hard to measure their results. And so should we consider this a success this Iraqi influence operation of success just because it did indeed break up the very solid coalition that had driven Saddam out of Kuwait in 1991? Um, or um, how do we how do we place the the influence, the importance of these influence operations against other factors that also led to the breakup of that West American-led coalition against Iraq? Yeah. Uh so it, it's it's a hard question. And success is always a difficult, you know metric right because yeah. what does it mean to be successful especially for a regime that doesn't survive um but can we ask if they were effective and mm -hmm. um there you know i'll have to give a, a cautious yes right mm -hmm. um and so as you alluded to in the question um and i'm sure most of the viewers uh remember or have read about that you know in the gulf war really the world kind of was united around this you know at least at the state level right mm -hmm. um american policies uh, towards Iraq, ex expelling Iraq. And after the Gulf War, probably less people know that uh, this coalition stayed together, right? Including, you know, countries like France and, and, and Russia were were 100% on board, right? Uh, for the first couple of years of, of the 1990s uh, and sort of keeping Iraq in a very tight vice of, of sanctions uh, and, and no-fly zones and using, um, you know, weapons inspections and all this to sort of keep, keep Saddam in a very small um, box. Now, a lot of these states didn't necessarily have, um, and also which say other actors as well, didn't necessarily have um, uh, interest in keeping Saddam in there, or they had interest in letting these sanctions fail or fade away uh, because there was money to be made um, in Iraq. Not all of them were super excited about uh, you know, what's been called American hyperpower, right? Just complete dominance, like we've never seen in probably in world history, at least for that decade of the 1990s, where um, the United States just dominated everything from finance to culture to international relations uh, to whatnot. You know, states like France and, and Russia had a sort of nationalist streak within them, which, which wasn't, this wasn't sitting well uh, with them. And there was resistance from within the Middle East as well. So the Ba'athists, you know, they couldn't create these mm -hmm. factors. This right. all existed outside of what the Ba'athists were doing. Uh, what they did well it, was to identify where there was a sort of incongruence. Hey, France or Russia is, is really supporting the United States, but there is a lot of discontent there uh, with the way things are playing out. Uh, and maybe we can just push them a little bit further, right? Um, so what they'll do is they'll what they where it seems and, and again it's hard to know right there right. because they, they see an open door and they push on it right, right. they see a, a state has inc has an inclination or but there's something innate there uh and they sort of prod that state to act on those inclinations where it's unclear that that state would have acted on the inclination without bathist prodding so mm -hmm. this is really things that are happening on the margins but yeah. um but these margins are quite important as i show in the book because they do um, separate this coalition. And by the end of the 1990s, well before 9-11, uh, the coalition is, is done, right? I mean, uh, the French and the Russians are openly uh, not just against sanctions, but they are, you know, openly defying, you know, the resolutions, which previously had, they claimed were sacrosanct. That you have to follow UN resolutions. They're binding. This is going to be a new way of doing things, international law. Uh, and Paris and Moscow are simply not doing that. Uh, anymore. Now, you know, we shouldn't say that it's just that Paris and Moscow are doing bad things and Americans were the good guys. Americans were also uh, doing all sorts of, you know, they, they were acting unilaterally. They were mm -hmm. drunk on their own sort of hyperpower, we could call it. Uh, and they weren't listening to anybody. They were taking steps that were out of, if not the letter of the law, at least the spirit of cooperation that had been, uh, in, you know, that, that had defined the 1990s and that had given the Iraqis this, this opportunity to sort of push uh, a lot of states and other non-state actors out of the American camp. Right. Did did the shift from the uh, from the H.W. Bush administration to the Clinton administration 
make a difference in either how the Iraqis approached questions or, you know, did the, did, did the administrations have different enough attitudes towards Iraq that it, uh, it played a role in this development? So one, um, the, the administrations really didn't have a very different, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you can see right away uh, when they're giving their sort of briefs, the various officials are giving their briefs at the Senate confirmation, they say, we're going to do the same thing, right? Yeah. We're just going to do what the previous administration did. And, and they adopt the same sort of rhetoric and the same policies uh, with all their problems. They were problematic policies that, were, that had all sorts of incongruencies. They wanted regime change, but they, they didn't have any strategies to do it. And they were just going to continue on with this, uh, um, this policy strategy mismatch going through. And they do that. The Iraqis, though, um, it, it should be said, in, when Clinton wins, Mm -hmm. The Iraqis think this is a real opportunity for them. Right. They see that Clinton was against Bush. They didn't like Bush, and they thought for sure uh, they would be able to ally with Clinton against Bush. And they have a, an, an enormous uh, campaign to reach out to Americans, um, you know, to, to find Americans that will that will be supportive and sympathetic to the Iraqi position. Uh, they bring some of them to Baghdad to interview Saddam, for example. Um, they are trying to find other Americans that might be sympathetic. They're reaching out to diplomats. They're having their friends in Europe or in the Middle East uh, reach out to their American counterparts, right? Different officials. Uh, so there is a, a huge campaign in uh, late 1992 and early 1993 uh, to turn the page with hmm. the Americans. Uh, it becomes very clear. It becomes clear within you know six to eight months that that uh, is not going to happen and that Clinton is simply going to continue on with the Bush administration and then the Iraqis uh, just sort of revert to their old ways. Did they have any particular, uh, the Iraqis that is, have any particular uh, channels or targets that they focused on when they tried to influence American policy, even when the administrations were not uh, helpful to them? Um, so they tried all sorts of different things. They were not, they, they keep on, they, they continued to discuss how unsuccessful hmm. and how difficult it was for them to operate in the United States. The United States was the most difficult place um, for them to operate. Where they they have some uh, some success is, is basically with NGOs and humanitarian uh, organizations. Some of them, you know, um, they, prop, they pop up, but, uh, particularly for this issue, right? There are, you mm -hmm. know, uh, campaigns to save Iraqi children, right? Because Iraqi children are, are, are suffering uh, tremendously under these sanctions. There are other, you know, Human Rights Watch and, and who are these other groups that are that are out there. Less so Human Rights Watch, because they're also concerned about um, the regime. But a lot of, a lot of, you know, Quakers in, in Pennsylvania, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, and they do reach out to these and they do organize them, right? And so you see uh, increasing protests in the United States, um, that are organized by, by these uh, these organizations. They, these organizations don't know that the Iraqis are behind it, right? They just think, hey, I have some members of the Iraqi diaspora here. They're really concerned about their friends and family. And we're really concerned about what Amer American sanctions are doing to innocent Iraqis. Uh, and, and they start, they start um, they start cooperating. There's also some Iraqi diaspora groups which form independently and then are co-opted uh, mm -hmm. by, by the Ba'athists. Now, some of those groups even though originally they start off as sort of apolitical and they say, we're not going to get involved. And some of them have, uh, you know, we are well-to-do Iraqis, uh, right. you know, in business and they do have, um, you know, uh, connections in, into Congress and, and everywhere else where they're, they're speaking with senators and they're speaking uh, to, to congressmen, uh, not just speaking, but having a, an influential voice with these, these congressmen. Um, they try to target some congressmen directly. There's a fellow in, uh, in Texas, Gonzalez, who has oil on his territory. Um, and very early on, he uh, he had been a big opponent of the Bush administration because you know, he was a Democrat, right? And he had been right. an opponent of the Bush administration during the Gulf War. And so the Iraqis said, ha, we can use this. He's got oil. In Texas, there's oil. Uh, this He's actually making a big name for himself uh, with his opposition to the Gulf War. Uh, we can use this. We can work through our people, through the oil companies, offer them concessions in Iraq and in influencing this, this man. Uh, as soon as Clinton comes into office, uh, he's no longer concerned about what Clinton is doing in Iraq, you know, even though Clinton is doing the same thing that Bush had done. And so that, that, um, that, falls, that falls away. But, the, but they're constantly speaking about how difficult it is for them to operate um, inside the United States, right? Other than, which right. is different than say Europe or the Middle East. Right. 
Well, and and it seems to me that the uh, uh, more broadly speaking, right, one of the issues that that anybody who studies what happens in Iraq in the 1990s has to deal with this issue of of the of the efficacy and the the long term political use of economic sanctions, right? You impose sanctions, right? Here at the War College, right, we teach. Uh, coercion theory, right? You're supposed you know, the coercion supposedly only works if you communicate to your enemy what it is that you want them to do, and if you give them a sense of what that's going to be. The problem with these, the, the that no economic sanctions can last forever. Although, well, I guess our friends in Havana might tell us that uh, right. you know you can sure try to keep them, but 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 will they actually work? And and the the idea is is it because you know there, and there is new scholarship on the the coming of the Iraq where I think of Joseph Steve's book about the the um, the regime change uh, uh, lobby. Is, let's say yeah. um, that if the American goal was regime change and only regime change, that's asking a lot of economic sanctions. And was there an awareness? And I ask this question both based on your research on the Iraqis, but also your your larger expertise in foreign policy. Right? When was there ever a sense in the United States that we're going to have to figure out something that the Iraqis can do to lift these sanctions because they can't stay on forever? It, it doesn't seem so. It seems yeah. actually that this is a problem that goes all the way back to the Gulf War, right? Yeah. yeah. In the Gulf War itself, uh, the U.S. tried to deca decapitate that regime. Um, yeah, right. And the assumptions, if you read the planning, and the assumptions at the end of the Gulf War is that Saddam's regime is no longer going to be there. Uh, and Bush expresses regret. He, he says, "I missed. I, I, I misjudged what 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 the the repercussions of this were. They they didn't think that Saddam was going to survive." Yeah. Um, and very early on, within a few months after the war, the Americans make very clear um, that the only acceptable solution is going to be. Uh, regime change. The problem that they have is that their allies don't agree, right? And this, they had, they had sold this war as part of a, a new world order in which we're going to come together at the UN and we're, there's going to be consensus and we're going to do this according to international law, which means UN resolutions. And there are no UN resolutions for regime change, right? There are only UN resolutions for compliance. And so officially, you know, officially the U.S., has uh, a policy of getting Iraq to comply. And they create strategies that are designed to get Iraq to comply with these ceasefire demands, disarming and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but unofficially, the US has a, uh, has a regime change uh, policy from the very beginning, <laughs> right? Um, you know, you can see Baker talking to his colleagues, right, um, in his papers, or Bush speaking with people on the phone, on the memcoms are, are now available. And he says, we're not gonna, we're not gonna live with, with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. No one should be, you know, living with this murderous regime. Clinton comes in too, right? And in the initial outreach, we have his responses, right? Some of these Iraqi NGOs, uh, Iraqis in America are reaching out to Clinton and, um, you know, they, they present themselves as, as a sort of nonpartisan NGO, but they're not because, their documents are going straight back to Baghdad, which is why right. we can read them. Uh, and they say to Clinton, "Listen, you know, you, you know, obviously this is a time to turn a new page, and Iraqis are excited about this." And Clinton responds, "This is, you know, Saddam's a murdering, you know, genocidal maniac. Like, and, and there's no way, and we're going to make him pay for his crimes." Um, and there are actually, you know, under Bush, and then under uh, under George H. W. Bush, um, and then under uh, Clinton, we now know there has all been, you know, sort of leaked out or declassified or whatever it is, there were um, CIA operations for, you know, to, to launch coups against him to overturn the regime. Um, and so you end up with a situation where you have an official policy and strategy, but then you have an unofficial kind of objective. Uh, and because those unofficial policy was just compliance, all the strategies are designed for compliance. But yeah. they're never going to be satisfied with that. They're only going to be satisfied with regime change, which means you're in a quagmire, right? Because you have a strategy that will never achieve uh, the objective that it's supposed to, that you know, that it's designed to achieve. And it would just go on forever, which is actually what makes our allies quite upset, right? Yeah. Uh, the French, the German, everyone else who's, who's um, bought into this idea of a new world order early on said, yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to give this a shot. Uh, um, but the UN resolutions were designed in a way that they had to be, they didn't expire and had to be renewed. They, they had to be voted down, right? They had to be overturned. Yeah. So they were in right. place as long as they couldn't get a resolution, another resolution to overturn them, they were going to continue in place. And the U.S. could simply veto any new resolution that tried to 
uh, tried to get rid of them. Um, and eventually some of our allies got tired of waiting um, mm -hmm. and didn't feel like they were being heard and started to defect. Right. Well, and 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 that's what I, I, I keep thinking of. And awareness, um, I, I guess the, the Iraqis were keeping track, like they saw what was going on. They recognized that uh, when it looked like the uh, the coalition was crumbling. Did that in any way, um, did, do you, do you, did you find evidence that when they saw that the, that there was a crack that they said, okay, we're going to really push hard on this issue because we're reading this in Le Monde. And so we know the French are really sensitive to this. So let's go with that. Were they that subtle and that directed? Yes. They, they, yeah. um, you know, it wasn't necessarily this particular article or something uh -huh. like that, yeah. but, um, you know, for example, Tariq Aziz, who was, had been the foreign minister and then becomes the deputy prime minister, but is still really running foreign relations. You know, they're, they're speaking to him and he says like, listen, the Americans, the, the, there's, there's no way, like this isn't going to happen. There's not, you know, they don't, we're the big villains. And he says in France, look, they're saying this, they, they say these, uh, you know, these other, um, we're, I'm speaking with people in France and there's a little bit more sympathy there. We can actually try, we can push it, right? Right. Um, and the same thing uh, in Russia, right? Um, they, they find people and they write back and say, actually, you know, we're getting a lot of support here, right? And then you'll see once they're getting a lot of support, they'll create like a committee, right? That, that sort of brings everyone together. The party officials, the intelligence, right? They'll always have like, um, you know, the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Religious Affairs because that can really help them with the propaganda. Um, and they'll bring all these these groups together, and then they'll send out people um, to to sort of infiltrate and to work uh, these these different issues um, in places. So when they see you know an open door, they push. Right they push, uh, yeah. now, they try. They keep on trying in America. They're the eternal optimists, <laughs> but uh, they they recognize that it's not necessarily working. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean they'll stop trying, but when when they uh, when they see an opportunity, they definitely recognize it and are able to exploit it. Right. So coming questions coming in from the audience, Fritz Heinzen asks a couple of, of interesting questions that I'd like to pose to you. One is he says the, about the documents themselves that you have dealt with and that is, were they redacted or edited in any way, or have you, or do, do you get to see them uh, in their purest form? Like what, what sort of restrictions yeah. are, especially when it comes to when they start naming names of organizations they're dealing with or, or individuals. So um, there's a, Go ahead. Yeah, take so that. There's a few first. sets. Of, there's a few sets of documents. There, there, are, there is a small group, and by small, it's, it's large by most standards, but it's small by by the Iraqi document standards of like 60, 70 thousand pages that were um, controlled by taken by the U.S. government from the state, from the Iraqi okay. state, mm -hmm. uh, and those were redacted and censored and 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 everything else. Um, there are some other documents that were from the Kurds, which have their own kind of story. But the main uh, the main set that I work with is is the the sectariat of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party. Uh, those are completely uncensored. No one really knows what's in there. Um, wow. And they're not well organized. And so, you know, people are finding things all the time. Um, now, they were at the Hoover Institution. They've now been returned to Iraq. And we have digital copies that are still at the Hoover Institution. And uh, they make you come in. They used to make you do like an institutional review board for, uh, that would you know, treat them as like human subjects. They don't do that anymore, but they do make you um, sign all these non-disclosure forms that mm -hmm. say, um, you know, if you find this type of information, you can't, you can't reveal these people's uh, names. And they also don't allow you to take any pictures. Uh, so you just have to sit there for months and months and months and dig through, you know. This is, this is the romance. This is the romance of historical research. So. Yeah. You just sit there, you know, with your laptop and take notes um, mm -hmm. on on these records. But yeah, there's nothing in there that uh, there's nothing that's been redacted or or removed. Um, and you know, it's something like 10 million pages. So people are still finding all sorts of new things uh, in there that no one knew um, existed outside of the regime. Uh, a, uh, I'm going to ask one real inside baseball question: Is when you when you're sitting in a, in the uh, archive reading. Uh, Arabic documents. Do you take notes in Arabic or do you take notes in English? Uh, so yeah, this is, this is so I, I do a hybrid. Uh -huh. I, I would say most researchers take notes in in, in Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sort of hybrid way of doing it, which is I read and then I take three types of notes. Okay. I take the first type of note that I don't, this is interesting. I don't think I'm going to use it. I just note that it's there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so I'll say like, hey, you know, this office was in Tunisia at this time, come back to this page if you need it, right? Uh, and then I take another, which is the most common, which is a, a sort of summary, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is just time management, right? I mean, I, like you sure. should spend your whole life there. So it's just a summary of, of, of what's going on. Uh, and then I have a third type of note where I take, uh, I, I directly translate. If something's really important, I directly mm -hmm. translate, uh, usually into English, but I, I do for very important lines within that, I will, you know, if it's like a paragraph or something like that, I will write it out. I will write the paragraph out uh, in Arabic or if something's unclear, I'll write mm -hmm. the paragraph, I'll write, the, I'll write it out in Arabic. Uh, but most of my notes are paraphrased and then a combination of paraphrased and then this direct quotes. And within those direct quotes, you know, the really, really important stuff uh, or something that's unclear, uh, I'll do in Arabic. Uh, sure. I, otherwise it just will say, I mean, you could just be there forever. Well, and, and I was thinking that that's the hard thing. And of course, when you talk about all these relatively uncategorized documents, like every time you find something interesting, it's like, so have I found the most interesting thing I'm going to find today? Or does this mean there's even more interesting stuff? Like there's got to be a pony in here someplace to, to go to an old joke. But um, uh, related to this, uh, Fritz's second question I wanted to ask for you is, uh, you know, these influence operations, is there any evidence in these documents that the influence operations also led to connections with uh, violent organizations or any any desire to influence policy through, let's say, direct action? Or is um, that, okay. was that, was that, in a, was that just a different thing altogether? Well, so there, there are, um, yes, there, there, there are. Um, uh, the Iraqis have a kind of taboo about speaking about violence in these documents normally. So they okay. don't, they usually they bring you right up to the, and then they usually give some euphemism of what happened. You know, so and so okay. received justice, you know. Uh, but um, also, the Iraqi Ba'ath Party itself uh, was usually not responsible for the violence. You have the Iraqi intelligence service, which is the Mukhabarat, mm -hmm. um, and they are working with the Ba'ath Party, but they're a separate organization. And so the Ba'ath Party will figure something else. The Ba'ath Party main job was to sort of uh, find out what's going on in the Iraqi diaspora and to um, try to influence the political situation in the countries where they are, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they had a what the regime considered a political uh, uh, program that they were executing. They weren't an intelligence organization, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they weren't a sort of unconventional warfare organization. Uh, which is different in, 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 in Iraq, they were kind of doing those mm -hmm. things, but outside they right. weren't, right? They would hand these, these projects, these, these, these programs over into to the Iraqi intelligence service. So you see, they, they get the, hey, something's going on here. You know, I'm getting these weird uh, newspaper, you know, I'm seeing these newspapers saying all these bad things about us and they, they're, they're quoting, you know, so-and-so, the Iraqi, you know, from Detroit or wherever, uh, and they hand it over, they, they send it up to the secretary and the secretary hands it over to, um, to the Iraqi intelligence service. We have some mm -hmm. files from the Iraqi intelligence service, but not, not anything near uh, what we have in the Ba'ath Party. Um, but yeah, you can see there are, you know, if you, if you follow through what happened to that person, they ended up dead, right? I mean, yeah, uh, there was right. poisonings. They, they used thallium. They like thallium putting in, you know, it's a rat poison. It's uh, really? odorless and, uh, and tasteless. And they, they would put it in people's drinks. Um, they would kidnap people, you know, um, they, they they had no problem um, doing you know resorting to violence. Actually, they had a school in in the uh, '90s that they opened up in the Iraqi intelligence service. Uh, it was a special school for assassinations and bombings, um, and it was sent off to um, the top ten. The top ten graduates every year it was fifty people graduated. The top ten always went to London. London, uh, and their main their main targets were uh, were mostly Iraqis. Um, they also then they said the next group to to Iran, and then the rest was uh, to the rest of the world. Um, and so, yeah, th that was what they did. So there's there's plenty of violence um, that results from these operations. Wow. Well, Anthony Clifton has a question that I want to uh, oppose and rephrase, and that is, he asks, you know, how has the focus of the Baathist changed, if at all? Right. We know that the Baath Party has been has been uh, disbanded. But uh, even even if the Ba'ath Party's gone right, these kinds of structures, do they persist? Do the Iraqis or the Iraqis have they they have more they have other fish to fry after two thousand three, um, so they're they're not as interested in influencing policy overseas. But is there any sense that there is still an effort by the Iraqis to uh, to influence global policy? 
No, I, I, not through these. Not through these. Oh. These networks, right? These networks, uh, the people are running them out. If they do exist out there in the world. They're 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 still out there. Uh, a lot of them are sort of angry, you know, you know people that will show up at, at events and and uh, and and you know say why Saddam wasn't that bad and you know the rest of the world is is uh, uh, was to blame. Um, but most of those they despise what happened after two thousand and three and they despise the new government. Um, and so they they weren't you know all this it just melted away. Some of them were actually captured, right? So there mm -hmm. are like in the United States there was a number of people. Um, who were arrested for acting as foreign agents of a, agents of a foreign regime, uh, and you know they're in jail. Um, but um, yeah, I, I don't think any of this. Uh, 2003 was a hard break. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing really survived after that. Well, so and and that gets then the question, right? It was, we we we've hinted at this a couple of times, right? Is you know, could this is this successful? Well, apparently not, because Saddam Saddam does not stay in power forever but he does hold on for longer than people thought he would. Um, when the Iraqis realized they were succeeding in breaking the United Front protecting sanctions, when the oil for food program is established, for example, or other uh, both overt, covert uh, end arounds around uh, uh, sanctions, did they, in especially like before, let's say before 9-11 or even after 9-11, did they think, oh man, we have, we've done it, right? We have broken this American conspiracy against Iraq and we're in the clear. Did they think um, that? Yeah, they, they, they do seem to think that, um, that they've broken it. They are mm -hmm. increasingly confident. They're being told this, you know, mm -hmm. even by like, for example, you know, French diplomats are telling them you know, uh, things that they probably don't want to, you know, that, that, that certainly isn't being released in the French archives, but it's being released in the <laughs> right. Um, when Iraqi delegations will go to France, they'll say, yeah, we're going to help you break out of this. And, you know, we're, we're doing, you know, you're pretty much out. And they've been reassured by the French and by the Russians that um, that they're going to oppose um, um, any type, any program to sort of bring war to Iraq or to reimpose this regime of sanctions and inspections and, and, and whatnot. Um, they're also sort of blinded by their own, the same instincts that had helped them to succeed in the 1990s to break up this, this organization, which uh, you know hurt them in 2003, in 2002 and 2003 to understand the threats that they face. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I mean by that is if we go back to you know Saddam being this party person, right? He was a populist, right? He saw not, he didn't see the world through the, through the lens of military art, you know, armies storming across borders, although there was a lot of that in, you know, in Iraqi history. Uh, he really was someone who looked to the masses, right, and wanted to sort of have um, the support of the masses and thought that this would be something that would like buoy him up, uh, you know, into power. But that was, that was where the wind was, was blowing in international politics. Uh, and so it was a kind of bottom-up approach, which served him well to break up yeah. these sanctions uh, in the 1990s. Um, but in 2000, and as we get past 9-11, uh, what he saw when Saddam looked at the world was uh, a world where um, the, the, the state coalition had broken up uh, and where he has massive international support, right? We have, you know, the United States, the war was fairly popular, but we're probably the only place in the world, um, mm -hmm. you know, around the world in February, there was the largest single protest, right? It was all linked uh, around the world coordinated protests, I guess we should say, single day coordinated protests ever in the history of the world, right? right? was against the Iraq war and the Iraqis saw that sort of thing and said, you know, there's no way that the US is going to be able to really uh, be a threat to this regime. Um, and this comes out of all of the, the sort of post-conflict uh, interrogations or debriefings with Iraqi security officials in the, in the military uh, and, and within the regime. And they asked them, they said, no, we didn't, we didn't see, we, we just didn't see the threat. We didn't think that they could actually do it. We thought maybe there would be some bombings. They would take a piece of Iraqi territory, but they wouldn't be able to drive all the way to Baghdad mm -hmm. uh, in the face of such opposition at all levels uh, from was, the bottom, right. from the bottom up. Uh, Boy, we showed them, huh, Sam? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there was a bit of that too, that yeah. they, 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 they overestimated us, right? And they thought, you know, <laughs> in Saddam in particular, there's a, one quote I'll have to find, but he says something along the lines of Americans wouldn't do anything that dumb, right? Mm -hmm. well, how is how are Americans going to rule Iraq, right? Uh, that, that, you know, um, so clearly 
um, overestimating uh, our, our stupidity on on that one. I mean, it's it's you know it, it's it's both when you, when things are that tragic, right? As the the old uh, uh, when I laugh at any mortal thing, it is that I may not weep. To quote yeah. uh, Keats, right? Is that this this idea about how do we how do we understand that the the because the sanctions were breaking down, there was a feeling in the United States that something had to be done, right? And because so either you drop regime change or you go to war, and the decision is made to go to war, and the Iraqis are surprised by this, um, and the war itself, right? As I said in the introductory comments, right? The war has had huge repercussions in the way that it that it especially because of the way that it turned out right that it it undermined uh, uh undermined american global credibility um it created huge problems it it gave further justifications you know when you listen when you listen to how vladimir putin talks about russian behavior as he says you know i don't need to, you know i don't want you to, i don't want to hear americans tell me about how i'm violating international law right who's been invading foreign countries long before we were doing it and so um, I guess that gets to this issue of, is it too much to say that um, the Iraqi influence operations, which broke down the new world order, that they changed the course of history? Um, you know, they I would say they pushed it. Uh, they pushed it, okay. In, in, a, in a certain direction. I mean, um, you know, the question is whether or not, you know, this whole, the breakdown was just inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, political scientists will give you all sorts of Good, strong answers for that. I'm not a political scientist. I'm a historian, so I, I'm not going to give you a really good, you know, confident answer about whether or not this this is enough. My 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 view as a historian is that nothing's inevitable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that there were tendencies, and there was certainly um, there were reasons to think. There are reasons to think that this new world order would have broken down without Iraqi actions, um, but you never know. Right. Um, and even if even if it would have broken down without Iraqi actions, the Iraqis certainly pushed uh, it to go faster um, and in a much more severe way. Right. Than um, than would have been without their actions. Their actions certainly accomplished something and they certainly influenced uh, the direction of history, uh, whether they changed it or not, uh, you know. Yeah, it's impossible to say. It's always hard to say. I mean, because I, I've I've been struggling with this too, right? Is the idea that as you know, historians, we uh, often we like to adopt this sort of tragic pose, right? That that we understand. This goes back to last month's People, Politics, and Prose with Bob Kaplan. But uh, that we we understand that people make decisions based on incomplete information. They don't know the future, and the consequences are as much of a surprise to them as they are to anybody else. Um, and you know, when you 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 confidently make decisions. Um, and then it all turns out so badly. It's a little bit like the the, the issue with Saddam that his, he, even though he knew he didn't have perhaps the um, weapons of mass destruction programs that the Americans thought he did, he couldn't bring himself to say that he didn't because he felt like that would, I don't know, right? That would undermine his his image. So in other words, by by claiming to have more success with WMD than he actually had, he ended up bringing upon himself the war that would overthrow him um, yeah i mean there's there's, there's a, I, I i i sort of push back against a little bit sure, the idea he please. Say, right uh yeah, all right. He, he tried telling everybody he didn't have that, right <laughs> <He tried. laughs> okay. um now he wasn't able to uh come clean on you know there are there are aspects of his program not the actual weapons themselves but a lot of the denial and deception program mm -hmm. uh and a lot of the lying that he did about the program early on uh, when he tried to hold on to those weapons, uh, he never came clean all the way about that because a lot of times coming clean was going to be a threat to his regime um, because the organizations that were hiding these weapons were also protecting him, um, mm -hmm. as well as, um, you know, the U.S. had sort of put him in a, in, a, in a sort of strange place where the incentives were all wrong, um, you know, where once you lie and then you, you get they find out that you're lying. They say, ah, see, you know, we knew he had some weapons or we knew. So every time Saddam would come forward with, with some more information, they uh, he would get punished, right? Mm -hmm. And so right. eventually he starts telling his people, you know, he says in several instances, listen, there's nothing we can do. Every time we show them what we have or what we did, uh, they just say, we knew you were a liar. See, now we have more sanctions and try to squeeze it out of you even more. Uh, and so you end up with this incentive structure where 
there's no incentive to cooperate. And he tells his people, he says, you know, listen, we can either have inspections, weapons inspections with sanctions, or uh, we can have, you know, sanctions with no weapons inspections because we keep the inspectors out. Uh, you know, either way, we're going to have sanctions. There's no way to get out of those. Uh, hmm. So why cooperate, right? So um, why cooperate. Yeah. Well, and, and and that's what I, I I keep coming back to with you know thinking about the story that you have to tell here, is you know the Iraqis they did have a strategy for dealing with the post uh, the post desert storm world, and they did implement that strategy, and that strategy involved influence operations, it involved some deception, some deflection, but it also involved just thinking that they could wait out the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, we're always going to be stuck with that question, right? It was, you know, what if they had been right, right? What if the Bush administration had chosen not to invade in 2003? What do you think would have happened? I know we're not in the what if business. Yeah. Neither of us is a bookie. It's all right. So I won't hold you to this. You know, yeah, you, I mean, I me think... and, the, and the thousands of people who are going to watch this. What happens if we yeah. don't, if we don't go to war? So, I mean, I think that they, they gradually uh, normalize their, their situation, right? They're, they're um, you know, the there is a sort of school of thought that came up that, that it developed after 2003 um in the us of so people who are opponents of the war who said listen saddam was contained right and we should have just yeah. kept him contained yeah. uh, I, I disagree with that um right. so the, the containment regime was breaking down the iraqi economy was coming back um there were no weapons inspectors in in the country right uh on 9 11 right they, they do come back at the very end but they had been kicked out of the country in 1998 um, the sanctions are breaking down, right? The no-fly zone is falling apart. France is defected. British have made it clear that they're, they're going to be done with this um, uh, pretty soon. Iraqi dip, there's, there's flights flying from Baghdad to other Arab capitals. Iraqi diplomats are being welcomed back in. Um, there was no way to keep Saddam contained. Now, it doesn't mean there were other options other than war, right? Mm -hmm. uh, once you recognize that containment is not an option, you know, you can design policies to sort of bring Iraq back into the international community in a responsible way, right? To try to, uh, you know, bring them, you give them the incentives to act the right way, right? right? Um, or you can just go to war, right? But the idea that we were just going to stay steady state with Iraq, um, I think that is, that's, uh, that's misguided. Um, and you'll never understand the decision that goes to, to invade in 2003, um, if that's the, uh, right. the starting point. Um, so, yeah. No, it's legit that the, the idea that uh, he was not contained, uh, and if the containment is breaking down, either you have to make your peace with the idea of him not being contained, and Iraq not being contained, which, which would have been a climb down for American policy, that, that American, that what three administrations had been unwilling to do. Um, or but, they could they could simply say that you know he doesn't have WMD. We're you know being able to accept right? Saddam's, declare, declare victory. Uh, you know, yeah. and there were other there were other shared. The Iraqis knew that there were shared interests with the United States, right? They, mm -hmm. they, when they talk about reaching out to Clinton, for example, they say, "Listen, we share an interest in containing Iran." For for example, we we share an interest in developing uh, Iraqi oil fields. Uh, you know, for example, right? Um, and so. They thought that maybe there's enough there that they could find a cooperative relationship with the United States, or at least a non-confrontational relationship um, with mm -hmm. the United States. But the U.S. it was going to have to climb down a little bit because mm -hmm. their policy had, well, I guess after 1998, the official policy was regime change. But prior to that, you know, there were ways to climb down because you can say the official policy is compliance, right. and they're complying. they're complying. So if they're complying, if they, they take two steps towards us. We can take take two steps towards them right um hmm. but they didn't or we but didn't, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> but they didn't right i mean it's fine talk about what could have happened and yeah. Yeah, we decided that war was the war was the option and yeah unfortunately we don't get to go back and rerun um that experiment That's um right. But we do, by going back and studying the different aspects of it that we perhaps didn't completely understand, um, we could get a better sense of what was going on between Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom. And, you know, Sam, your book goes a long way in helping people understand that. What's next for you? What are you, what do you, what do you think about, I mean, granted, the last thing anybody wants to be asked when they just yeah. went to all the trouble to write a book is what are you going to do now? But what are you going to do now, Sam? Um, so I have a few projects that I'm working on. I'm right, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a very small 
uh, Oxford has these very short introduction series. So mm -hmm. there's a, uh, I have a contract to write one of those for a very short introduction to the Iraq wars, mm -hmm. uh, plural. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's an it's the idea. It's you know it's going to be a very slim volume, but it's going to try to um, present the Gulf War through basically 2018 and ISIS campaign uh, as one continuous uh, war that was a sort of defining moment or defining conflict of of the post Cold War. Uh, period, and uh, you know, there's a an edited volume uh, in the works with a with a um, a conference tied to it um, this summer. Um, so that's taking that's going to take a lot of time. Um, and so those two projects I'm working on, and you know, a, a few small side projects uh, here and there. I'm probably going to shift gears a little bit after this, after I work all those and and. Um, and do some other things in Middle Eastern history uh, that that aren't necessarily Iraq, but uh, yeah, that's that's the plan. Um, and then one one last question I just want to ask, and that is that uh, you know, Sam, you 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 served in the Middle East, right? You served you served, you were an Iraq War veteran. Um, if you'd known some of these things about what the Iraqis were doing or not doing when you had been when you were serving, would it have made you think differently about the war that you were engaged in? Um. I don't know. Well, first of all, I was very young, I should say, right? Well, I was 22 years old. I'd like to so say we really, were all very young back then, but I was, okay. I was very young and I thought we were winning. Uh, <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure that it would necessarily have uh, changed my opinion one way or the other at my level, at yeah. a very junior level, you sure. know, very much. Uh, um, we're, we're, we're at a very tactical level where, where the rubber meets the road type of stuff and not doing anything that was grand policy or, or thinking about diplomacy or strategy. It was more like, hey, is there a missile coming this way? <laughs> you know? uh, and and um, uh, those were my concerns. Um, I don't know at that time whether I would have been able to digest all of this and, and put it into a sort of framework uh, that would have made a difference uh, one way or or, or the other um, for me. Even today, after having researched this, you know, what does it mean about um, the war and the way it was conducted? I mean, it shows that the U.S. wasn't prepared uh, mm -hmm. and didn't know what it was uh, facing, which should give you pause if you're going to take over another country. Um, but other than that, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell you much about right or wrong. Just kind of tells you what 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 happened, um, yeah. which I think is, is important. It is important. And th we thank you for helping us to understand it. So Sam Helfand, thanks for joining us today on People, Politics, and Prose and sharing your insights. Uh, Iraq Against the World is available in bookstores now. That's right. That's right. So go get yourself a copy. There you, there you go. go. There you go. Sam Helfand has his copy. You, you should go get yours. But thanks. Thanks, Sam, for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us as well. FPRI thanks our sponsors and partners for their generous support, which makes programs like this possible. And if you found this conversation interesting, we hope that you will consider becoming a member partner supporter of FPRI so that we can continue to organize conversations like this one. Today's conversation is just the beginning. The world goes on and we will always be here to discuss it at FPRI. If you've enjoyed our discussion today, please tell a friend and Bring a friend next time when we gather to talk about our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter, at Ronald Granary. You can follow Sam Helfont on Twitter, at Helfont Samuel. One way or another, we look forward to hearing from you, and we look forward to welcoming you to future conversations. But until next time, for all of us at FPRI who make these things possible, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us.